All right, as, as is usually my practice when I am here, I like to use a board, so let me make sure I have room to work. Um, this morning I want to talk about, um, let me see, I would like to entitle my presentation, Guilt, Performance, and Judgment. And um, I'd like to write those three words on the board because <clears throat> I think in looking at it, we can not only learn a few things, but also emphasize some things that we already know already. Guilt, performance, and judgment. All right, I would like, I would like to, um, I would like to start by pointing out that on these three particular words, there's a great deal of misunderstanding. All right, there, there's a common understanding, and the common understanding is based on some strong misunderstanding. Maybe some of us may still have some relics of this misunderstanding, in which case maybe we need the, the, what I'm about to say this morning. But let me first of all start by looking at the misunderstandings as I understand it. Um, first of all, where guilt is concerned, the whole world starts with a certain premise. And <clears throat> it's not just in the, in the, in the realm of religion. <clears throat> in everything we start out on this premise. But I think it started from religion and it builds on religion. So the first premise is that man is to blame. All right, man is to blame. That's number one. I think this is number one misconception. Man is to blame. Um, number two, well, number one also, and under performance, we believe, we are taught, man must do better. All right, if, 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 if there's something that I write down that um, doesn't make sense to you, then of course, you can p stop me and let me pause and let me, let me explain what I mean. And where judgment is concerned, the judgment focuses on man. So far, it's just basically the way we understand it, or am I wrong? I'm not saying we understand it this way. I'm saying is this basically what people understand? All right, people believe that you are to blame for the wrong you did, and you are guilty for the wrong you did, and so the consequence is that you must try to do better. You must do better. The focus is on your performance. And I think from the day we are born till the day we die, everybody is obsessed with performance. They refer to it as sin. And, and we, we have it in our mind that the whole point of everything that is happening in the world and in the universe is about sin. Uh, it's, it's like a revelation to me when I came to understand that this is wrong because even in my religious life, my whole life, you know what was my obsession? This. And even every Christian today, if you ask them, they say the problem is to overcome sin. Ministries are set up and based on the idea of overcoming sin. We, we kind of get the idea that God, God is obsessed with sin. And so because God is obsessed with sin, we also are to be obsessed with sin. And so everything, sin is central to everything. And sin, of course, has to do with performance. And then, of course, at the end of it, we understand that there is to be a judgment, and the judgment is based on these two ideas. You are to blame, and you are expected to do better, and the judgment will, the judgment will examine 
Where, did you do well enough? That's what the judgment will examine. And um, of course, the judgment assumes that if you, if you didn't do well enough, you are to blame. And so the judgment will prove that you are to be blamed. And it will either, or, or, that, or that you were innocent. And so it will either reward you or condemn you. Now you look at this, and this is basically the concept of Christianity and even religion. Even non-Christian religions have this basic idea that there is Islam believes it, and almost every religion that I know believes the same thing. Now, we, we, have, we have come a step further, and we have come to understand <laughs> a little better, but some of us still understand that man is blamed from birth. It's still there. It's still there and tends to want to override All right. I understand that, right? And I understand that. And maybe, pre maybe by, by looking at things like this over and over again, it will eventually begin to sink in. Because I think my, my subconscious mind... Yeah. Okay. Praise the Lord. My subconscious mind is getting it that I am I'm not feeling that subliminal sense of condemnation or guilt anymore. Which sometimes you know that it shouldn't be there, but your subconscious mind and your history is still putting a burden on you. Um, and so you, you, you believe that man is blamed from birth, that's number one. And you also believe that he is um, condemned, condemned or blamed for a lack of performance, for bad performance. And so, what is the consequence? We live under threat. You see, Tina? We live under threat. Christians may not say as much, but in the mind of most Christians, there's a subliminal fear that at the end, I may not do well enough and I may be condemned in the judgment. So, for many Christians... Christianity is really like you are, you are continuing under a, a sense of uncertainty. I mean, there are some Christians who go to the other extreme, okay? They say, it doesn't matter at all, and I can live any way I want, and I will still make it into the kingdom. That's another extreme that we might not examine this morning, but you know that people who take that position, they don't really know God. Those are the people that will wake up at the end and recognize that. They hear the voice that says, I never knew you. All right, but we're going, to, we're going to try to tie it all together. But I want us to look at this. Because this, I believe, is the reality of what? Of, of, of the common understanding. Man is to blame, and he was blamed from the time he was born. We believe that we were born in a fallen condition. Born sinners, we would say. And we believe that because of this. <clears throat> and then we add to it by being condemned for a bad performance. And we believe that the judgment is to examine and focus on us. And therefore, it's logical and reasonable, reasonable that you live under threat and you live under a sense of uncertainty. Now, I believe that just by starting out here, we set ourselves in a position where the rest of your life as a Christian, you're constantly under, under, under trouble. You're constantly in trouble. And um, it may explain why a lot of Christians still suffer from stress, Still suffer from a bad stomach and high blood pressure and all the rest of it because yes. So I'm going to I'm going to put what I what I understand to be the true position underneath here, right? First of all, this is this is the position the position I believe of the true gospel, the good news. All right, and the first thing I'm going to say is that. This is something I never understood and I would never have said it, but here I am freely saying it. Man is a victim. Not the Ten Commandments per se, but the, 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 the idea of 
an obligation to perform. The Ten Commandments set, sets up that standard of performance in a certain time. But even people move over, over to the New Testament, and what do they say? They say, we are free from the Ten Commandments, but we are under the commandment to love your enemies. That is harder than the Ten Commandments. <laughs> right? So it, it, that becomes a second standard of condemnation, because if I don't love my enemies, I feel that same sense of guilt. And most of us don't love our enemies. We tolerate them. We might even pray for them, but we don't love them. So if, 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 if we set ourselves and say, well, we have a higher standard, we are no longer under the, under the Ten Commandments, but we are under the commandment of love, it's more difficult. So it's, it's the sense of obligation that is a problem, not the Ten Commandments per se. So here is where an understanding of the true gospel begins to come. Instead of man being to blame, the first thing that happened is that we realize, we, we realize that man is a victim. All right, there's a difference between somebody who rapes a person and a person who is raped. They are not in the same position at all. Sometimes in society they have a way that if they know a lady is raped, people can have looked down on her away. Because that's a perverted way people's minds behave. And you know that the poor lady, she has absolutely no blame. But somehow she feels a sense of guilt. Like she could have done something about it, like it was her fault. And even people kind of have a kind of stigma around her. Which, you know, is, is, is so unreasonable and terrible. Because she's not, she's not to blame. She's a victim. Now let me demonstrate that we are really victims and not to blame. Let me just remind you of the reality. And I understand that God knows this. And that is what helps me to be comfortable with God regardless. I did not ask to be born. I used to tell my parents that. When they used to try to make me... Make me <laughs> when they used to try to, to correct me for things that I did. And used to talk to me hard. One of the things I used to say. I didn't ask to be born. I would say to my mother, I didn't ask you to burn me. That's what I would say. Okay? And it was my way of saying, if I, am, if I am not the person I should be and if I'm a bad person, you put me here. And I didn't ask to be born here. <clears throat> not only this, but I remember, I remember, remember things that happened to me as a boy. I don't know if they shaped my life. You know, I, I remember when I was like four years old, some grown up, Girls used to come to the home. Daddy was a pastor and he used to have people coming around the home all the time. And we little boys, <clears throat> they would take us to the, in little corners and whisper things in our ears. Right? Girls? Yeah, I mean, grown girls like in their teens are almost big women. I had an incident with a big girl who used to work with us that I won't repeat. Right? <clears throat> it wasn't me alone. It was three of us brothers. Right? I won't go into the details, but anyway. But I was four years old, a little boy. Things made indelible, indelible impressions on my mind. I didn't ask for it. I didn't ask for it, and I grew up in this kind of environment where things happened that molded my character. I went to school, and the boys told me dirty stories in class, and they brought books to, the worst books I ever read in my life. I got at school, right? I won't name them. But I realized that these were the worst and most promiscuous books in existence in the planet. I could tell you the names of them, but I won't. And um, I got them in school. Right? So I realized that I was a victim. I grew up and I began to live what was implanted in my mind at, before I was born and as a child. And I realized that even children who grew up Sheltered. You don't escape it. You can't get away from it. You live in a world where there's television. You live in a world where you go out on the street and you see all kinds of things. You can't put a person in a cocoon and lock them up that they don't know what is happening in the world. We did not ask to be born. We didn't ask to be put here. We happen to be here and we happen to be in a world where we ourselves in the 21st century, we were born in a crazy world. How old are you, Jordan? 18. He was born in the 21st century. Right? 
He was born in the worst century that the planet has ever seen. I was, I was born in the 20th century. I kind of got most of the 20th century, but it was nothing compared to what has happened since this century started. And we are just entering upon, I don't know, I, I, I put a post this morning on Facebook, and I made a comment somewhere where I said, if Jesus does not come soon, he will have to abandon this planet. And that's a fact. The people who don't realize of the imminence of the coming of the Lord are, are, are totally blind. They don't know what is going on. But it has gotten to a place where uh, this, this thing that they have created recently called, called Chat GPT. Okay, everybody is hearing about this Chat GPT. But if you think of the implications of it, yeah, there, there's no limit for good or for evil. And you know they will use it for evil, right? I mean, humanity is becoming obsolete. They don't need you. This thing can write essays. It can write programs. It can do everything far, far better than any human being can do it. What, do, what are you necessary for? It can become your accountant. It can become your advisor. Everything. They don't need people anymore. And you wonder where will it all end? But you don't need right. But but we, we were born in this situation. I didn't ask to be born. So don't blame me. Don't blame me that I was born bad. And don't blame me that I can't do better. The Bible teaches that I'm a victim. And these are some of the verses that I never learned in the first part of my life, even as a Christian. In Romans 5 and verse 12, it says, Romans 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. When the one man sinned, I was a victim. I wasn't there. You can't blame me for what Adam did. As a matter of fact, in verse 19 of the same, same chapter, Romans 5. It says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. How did you become a sinner? It was because of one man's disobedience. He disobeyed and you, you became a sinner. You, um, he picked the fruit and it fell on your head. Okay. Well, he himself was a victim in a sense, but he had a chance to make a decision. You didn't get that chance. Both him and his wife had a chance to make a decision. They made a choice. You didn't get that chance. I was born a victim of what he did. So, it seems unreasonable to expect me to, 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 to focus on, on judging me at the end when I'm a victim. You don't judge a victim. You don't judge a woman who is raped because she was raped. Look for the rapist. Don't judge the woman. You don't victimize the victim. Yet the idea of religion that people have many people have is that the victim is the one that is victimized at the end. And a lot of people find it fearful and unreasonable that God should judge the sinner when you understand the background. In Psalm 51 and verse 5, you know, this is what David was kind of bemoaning when, when he took Uriah's wife and killed Uriah. And when he, he realized his sin, look at what he says. This is kind of, a, he's trying to make an excuse. And I kind of sympathize with him too. Look at what he says. He says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. You ever wondered why that is in Psalm 51? <laughs> David is talking about what he did with Uriah's wife. And how he killed Uriah. And he puts, this, and he puts it in the psalm and he says, he's trying to say, God or whoever he's talking to, remember that I was born this way. Remember that I, 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 I couldn't help myself. I'm asking you to consider this. When you look at the terrible thing I did, consider that I am innately evil. That's what he said. So the Bible teaches that man from birth is a victim. I know that many years ago, when I was a boy, they had a, they had a pill that they were using. Women, pregnant women were using it for, for something, but it was called thalidomide pills. And to our astonishment, we saw that about a year later, babies started to be born without hands, without feet, all kinds of deformity. 
for morning sickness or whatever. But they found that it was a pill they were taking. It's a long time me medical, the medical field has been messing up humanity. A lot of babies, even today, adults who grew up without hands and without legs and different parts because of those pills. Those children were victims. If they, if they couldn't walk and they couldn't brush their own teeth and they couldn't feed themselves, you saw pictures of babies using their feet to feed themselves. It wasn't their fault. They were victims. You can't blame them because they can't run or they can't perform like you, an able-bodied child. It's a similar thing with a person who is born in sin, according to what we see in the Bible. And this is what Paul meant. This is what Paul meant when he says in Romans 7, verse 14. I want you to, look, to consider this. Look at what Paul says. He's kind of doing like what David said when David said, I was born in sin. Look at what David said. Look at what Paul said. Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am what? Sold under sin. What does he mean when he says, I, I, I am sold under sin? He's a slave. He's a slave. He's talking about the fact that you can try, but you can't succeed. Because a slave is like that. A slave, a slave has no option about how he behaves. He's told what to do when he gets up in the morning. Where to go, where he's going to work, what he's going to wear, what he's going to eat. He, he has no control. Paul says, the law is spiritual. The, the, the commandments say, I should do this, I should do that. But I am a slave. And his point is, I can't do better. Man must do better, but you can't do better. You are condemned for your bad performance, but you can't do better. If you look at verses 18 and 19 of the same chapter, Romans 7. He excuses himself because he can't do better. And he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. I am willing. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. What he's saying is that I'm trying so hard to do the right thing. But I'm failing all the time. And he's saying, it's not I who, who I'm doing it. It's sin that is living in me. Where did, it, where did this sin come from living inside of me? I was born with it. I was born in a condition of sin. Zaini? Shh. Shh. Okay, Zane. I was born in a condition of sin. I was born a slave to sin. So, he's saying I can't help myself. And that is what the Bible teaches. Where guilt is concerned, man is a victim. Where performance is concerned, man cannot do better. <laughs> like I know he can't do better, but... <laughs> <laughs> I just have to try to restrain it. Man cannot do better, right? Man must do better. Man cannot do better. Man is to blame. Man is a victim. This is the popular idea. This is the truth. This is the popular idea. This is the truth. You can't do better. There are, there, 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 I, I, every one of us maybe can, t can repeat my story. I don't know how many of you went as bad as I went, but I tried to do better. I tried to be better. Huh? Me and God, no. I'm sure everybody has his secrets. Everybody has his secrets. So I can't speak for anybody. But I know that the sense of my past, but for God, it would ride me night and day. So some people, it don't seem to bother them like it bother me. Maybe that is it. Maybe people are worse than me, but it don't bother them like it bother me. Because, but for the grace of God, I would live under a constant sense of condemnation. I think that is one of the things that God has, has blessed me with, is a sense of, of how bad it was, even if it didn't seem so bad to other people. One of the things I know is that in my past, there are things that I'll be glad to forget one day. And maybe it's true for everybody. But for me, it has helped me to come to a place where I appreciate the grace of God like very few people can appreciate it, because I recognize how... But and what it is for you. 
and what he did for me. Yeah, so maybe there are others who have a similar situation, but as I say, a man can only talk about himself. So, this is the truth. Now, the, 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 the answer to all of this, the answer to all of this is that there is an answer, right? There is an answer. First of all, we start with a misconception. The first, the first level here is where most of the Christian world is, is under misunderstanding. Okay? Uh, even people who go down the street and witness, sometimes you see them on YouTube and they end up focusing on condemnation. They end up telling people, you're going to be judged, you're going to be, come stand before one God, God one day and you're going to be condemned for your sins and so forth. And they, they end up by threatening people. Right? The first thing that I think people need to understand is that we are victims. The first thing. They, they, some people have the idea that if you say to people you are not to blame, you set people free to do whatever they want to do. And in a sense that is true. Whether you set them free or not, they will do it. You, need, I, I, you think I need to tell people that, is, that people are thieves for them to steal? Or to tell people that they are fornicators or adulterers or murderers? Whether you tell them so or not, they will do it just the same. The first thing is to admit the truth about yourself. The person who thinks that he can do better will keep on trying to do better. He will never come to God for the grace of God because he thinks he's capable. That's why a lot of people don't become Christians. They think that they are able in themselves to live the way God wants them to live. They never think it is necessary. It's, it's only when the conviction of God comes to a person's mind that he begins to really look into himself and try to do what God wants and discovers that it is impossible. You can do something sometimes. You can't please God in every way all the time. There's always that element of the carnal nature that drags you down if you're honest with yourself. So, this is a problem. This is the truth. Up here is the misconception. This is the truth. Man is a victim and man cannot do better. First of all, you face that. I'm a victim. All right, the first thing about knowing that I'm a victim is this. I recognize... I, 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 I didn't have anything there, but I'll consider it in a moment, all right? But the first thing about man being a victim is this. You know, the first thing I realize, if God is a reasonable person and God is really a loving person, he can't blame me for being a victim. The first thing it does is take a weight off me because I have two things riding me. Number one is my own inability and secondly is God's condemnation. It makes me afraid of God. It makes me cautious around God. It makes me not want to face God. And the first thing I realize is that I'm a victim. How can a good God blame me for being a victim? Uh, let's talk about, I mean, I have certain experiences with, with, with my children and my, and my grand, grandchildren that stick in my mind. Like last week I mentioned about, um, you know, I don't want to say it in his, in his, but he's here, so I might as well say it, right? I remember him saying, when his mother was, was saying to him to stop doing a certain thing, he was crying and kind of like in a temper, and his mother said, stop it, stop it, or else this will be the consequence. And he said, I'm trying, I'm trying, but it's so hard for a little five-year-old boy to say that, or a six-year-old boy to say that. I'm his grandfather and I'm listening. What do I feel? <laughs> I'm trying, but it's so hard. How could I say Try harder. How could I say that? How could I say, if you don't, this will be the consequence. When you, when, you, when you hear somebody saying, I'm trying and you know it is true and it's hard. How do you feel as a parent or a grandparent? How does God feel when I say, I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm just not making it. How does he feel? Judgment for you. All right, that, that is a popular concept within, 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 within Christendom. The first thing to realize when you understand that you're a victim and that you're facing a God of love is that God understands and he's on my side. He knows what I am and he knows it's not my fault. He knows how I was born. He knows my circumstances. He knew the environment I grew up with. And he's on my side. That's the first step. And when you recognize that you're on your way to beginning to come to the place where you recognize what it means to really be a child of God and what it means to be a Christian. You recognize God is on your side. He's no, long, no longer the judge sitting on one side and waiting to see if you meet the standard or else he will smite you. 
Absolutely. That I could be a better grandfather than God is a father. I mean, ridiculous. So, God did something. God did something. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19, this is what it says. It says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now, now, what God did was he removed, he removed guilt. He removed guilt. All right? Whoever, whoever is to blame, you don't, it's not your business anymore. Whether it's you or Adam or anybody in the world, it doesn't matter anymore. What did God do? God took this out of the way. It says, how did he do it? He says, through his son, he reconciled not just a Christian like me or a Christian like Jordan. He reconciled the world. Everybody to himself. And it says, not imputing their trespasses. What is another word for trespass? Sin. sin. When you impute sin to a person, what it means? You count them as guilty. You charge them with it. The Bible says God took away the charge of guilt that was upon the world. And he took it out of the way. And he has given you and me as a Christian the word to tell the world what he has done. So God has opened the door on his side and he says, look here. No matter what you did, it doesn't matter. No matter what you will do, it doesn't matter. The door is open. All I want you to do is accept what I did for you. And it is you and me who have the opportunity and the privilege of telling people. So the whole world is saved if the world would only believe it. God dealt with this part of it completely. Guilt is no longer an issue. It never was an issue since God sent his son to die for our sins. If you look at what it says in Revelation, let me just read a few verses quickly. Revelation 1 and verse 5. From Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and what? Washed us from our sins in his blood. Done, dusted, and sealed. Washed us from our sins in his blood. Romans 5 and verse 18. As by one the offense of one, therefore as by the offense of one, Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That was Adam. We were victims. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So, we were victims because of Adam. And if I may use it in a, in, in, in a, in a positive way now, we are victims of Christ. I like that kind of victimization. Right? Adam victimized us, if you want to put it that way. We became victims of sin, slaves, condemned by birth because of Adam. So God found a different, a second Adam. And we are victimized a second time, this time in a positive way. He did something for us outside of ourselves and independent of ourselves in order to save us. So, now I can say I was born bad. But I can say I was born again good. Right? I can say my bad birth... It, 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 it victimized me all my life and now I have no complaints because God has provided something else to deal with that. Amen. Hallelujah and praise the Lord. When I discovered this, I was overwhelmed with the sense of my acceptance. I was overwhelmed with the, 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 the sense of what God did for me. Now that's part one. It takes care of the guilt problem. What about the performance part? 2 Corinthians, well, let me read another one. Galatians 2 and verse 20. I'll come back to that one. Galatians 2 and verse 20 says, listen to this now. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ is living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So first of all, Christ, God sent Jesus Christ, God sent his son and he took my guilt out of the way. But what else does he do? He sent Jesus to die for me. What else does Jesus do for me? He not only dies for me, but he what? He lives 
in me. That's what it means to be born again. God puts the spirit of his son into my heart. I'm born again. I become a different person. Something changed in me the day that I was born again. And every Christian knows it. Something changed inside. Whereas I used to love certain things. My mind changed from it. I, I wasn't perfect. I never immediately started to live a, uh, the, the, the life up on the mountaintop. But, I, but, but my, my perspective and my outlook changed. Now I wanted some things that I never wanted before. Now I hated what I used to love. Something changed. Christ came to live inside of me. And what Jesus did, it says he first of all removed my, my guilt. And secondly, I'm going to put something here. But let me read another verse. Philippians 2 and verse 13. Look at what this says. Speaking to you who are born again. Philippians 2 and verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now notice what it says. It says man must do better. What can I put down here? God does the better. Right? God does for you. Let me put it there. God does for you. Or God performs for you. God performs for you. The, 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 the common idea is that man must do better. And we are condemned by our, our, our bad performance. The truth is that we cannot do better. And the corollary truth that goes with that is that God performs or God does it for you. With your cooperation. With your cooperation. By accepting Christ. By believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus comes to live in you. Now he... he, he he works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, everything that was negated by Adam up here, everything that was negated by your history and by your past, God comes to give you a new history. So, and I could read, I could read a few more verses. Romans 8 and verse 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We are set free from ourselves. We are set free to be what we always should have been. But we were condemned and we were, we, were, we were disenfranchised by our heritage. So God gives us a different heritage. In, 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 in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7 it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in vessels of dirt, in bodies of clay, we have a treasure. Why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So the very fact that I was so helpless and so worthless and so incapable is a statement to the glory of God. When somebody sees somebody like, sometimes I go back to where I used to live, back in my, my worst days. Back to, back to Falmouth. I used to live there. And that was, the, that was the, the, the days when I broke out. And then I carried it over to when I came to Manchester here. But I go back among the people that I used to know and I go back to the places. And they don't recognize... I mean, okay. Of course they recognize my face. But I look at the things I used to do and the places I used to go and I look at the people. And it's like it's a different planet I look, it's, it's like a different planet. I saw a picture of one of them in the, in, the, in the newspaper some time ago, a couple of years ago, and I couldn't recognize the person's face. As when I saw the name, I recognized that it was a person. And when I looked, I could kind of make out because the, 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 the depravity of the condition that I once lived in, it shows on the person's whole face and whole entire being. And I, I, I know that I have aged, but I, I know that... Even on my, on my external appearance, the, the, the grace of God has had an effect. Amen. You know? Well, somebody else should talk, not me, but I think so. <laughs> so, what about the judgment? I, 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 I am not going to put something there yet till I think about that. But if you look at John 5 and verse 24, it says... Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on me, on him that sent me, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The thing is that the word condemnation 
is translated as judgment in almost every other version. In the NASB, for example, it says, He has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. So, what does it mean? Where judgment is concerned, we in Christ, we have passed from judgment. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Jesus Christ was judged in my place. He was condemned and he died in my place. How can I still be judged? He, what, what, what sentence was passed upon Christ? Huh? Yes, yeah, separation from God, technically, but condemnation came upon Christ. You might call it guilt if, if you think in the, in the common term. Christ was, 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 was sentenced to die because my sin was upon him. If you want to use the common paradigm. How can I be judged for the same thing? You can't judge me for what was already, the, the penalty was already paid. So, in everything, my guilt is removed. God performs for me. I satisfy the performance criteria. I satisfy the guilt criteria. And I've passed from judgment. I've passed to life. I don't come into judgment. This is the state and the reality of the Christian. So, yes. In other words, you can't judge me if I was already judged. I was already judged and I was already sentenced to die. Christ took it. So how can you judge me again when you already judge me in Christ? Remember, I'm not, I'm not standing before God as me. I'm standing before God as Jesus Christ. Because I'm in Christ. I have the life of Christ. I'm under the umbrella of Christ. I'm in the environment of the body of Christ. God is not judging me as David. He's judging me as a part of Christ because I've accepted Jesus. When I've accepted Jesus, it doesn't mean that, say, I decide to turn over my life. That's what people think, right? No. I've chosen to become a part of the existence of Jesus Christ. So I'm a part of the body of Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. I'm accepted in the beloved. God accepts me in Christ. He doesn't accept me as David. One person is being saved. It's Jesus Christ. Martina is not being saved. Brother Bill is not being saved. You are being saved as a part of Jesus Christ. If you are not in him, there is no salvation. So, so once you understand this, you understand that everything that Jesus did, it was you it was happening to. The only thing you have to do is to accept Christ. And that's the simplicity of the good news. He did have a choice when he was born, but he had a choice now. Right. And the only choice I have is to accept this new life. And when I accept it, it's done and finished. Now, there is another question that comes up. If all of this is true, and I think everybody who looks at this, even superficially, will understand that it is true. The question is, the question is, and there's a question. Am I trying to say that there's not going to be a judgment? No, I'm not saying that. Why then is there to be a judgment if all of this is settled? All right, somebody might say there's a judgment for those who don't accept Christ. And I accept that. There's a judgment where it will be demonstrated that you never accepted Christ. Therefore, you never escaped from this. Because you never accepted Christ. But there's something else where Christians are concerned. Because I think all of us recognize that even Christians in, in the book of Daniel, it teaches that there's a judgment that takes place that involves Christians. It's also in the book of Revelation, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. But let me ask you. What is the point of a judgment then if all of this has already been taken care of? And um, I'm going to explain. Yeah? To judge the life that is mine. All right, I don't know if I can erase this. Because I need space to write. If you have it in your brain, I guess I can get rid of it. Huh? <laughs> yes, I, I hope. I plan to. So, there is a judgment then because there's a, there, is, there is a judgment and I'm going to put something here that I will demonstrate in a moment. The purpose of the judgment is to judge Christ's work. 
All right? The purpose of the judgment is not to judge your salvation. It's to judge the work of Christ. Two things that Christ took care of. What was number one? Based on what I had on the board. Guilt. Covered, right? When you say covered in Jamaica, we mean settled as you say, Peter. What was the second one? Performance. Performance. What would we say about that? How can you prove that his performance works? Right. It's your life that demonstrates whether or not number two is working. It's your life that demonstrates number two. This is settled. Let me put settled instead of cover, because somebody might under- misunderstand. This is, number two is pending. What does the word pending mean? It's not finished and it's not settled. You know it's not settled, settled, Sister Andrea? Because all of us as Christians, we disprove this again and again. Nobody can bring this against any Christian. In Isaiah 54, it says that every, every mouth that shall rise against you in the judgment, you shall condemn. Every tongue that shall rise against you in the judgment, you will condemn. Because the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. You can't be condemned for guilt anymore. And you will never be condemned because this is what determines whether you are going to be saved. But this part of it has a purpose too. And this is the part where Christians fall. We, 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 we argue, we quarrel, we make noise, we misbehave. We mistreat people. We let down the Lord by our behavior. That is the part that is still not settled. And I think that this is what the judgment is about. It's to, it's to settle the question of performance. But whose performance? Whose performance? Thank you, Sister Hedda. Why do we say Christ's performance? Why is it Christ's performance? Because... It is Christ that worketh in me to do his will and his good pleasure. What does it say? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? You remember the rest of that verse? Anybody remember? If you want to put it in our own, own, own terminology, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that God may get the credit. Okay? When, when, a, when, a, when a little dirt bog like you or me Produces something good. Who gets the credit? <laughs> Every little dirt bag on this earth is trying to take credit to himself. But when we see something good in somebody who was such a reprobate, everybody says, God good. God good. Can you imagine him? That you know his history and look at him today. God gets the credit. And that is the point because... There is a second part to what God is doing. Number one is that God is trying to save man. Done and accomplished. But the second part, Jesus said it in Matthew 5 and verse 16. Who knows that verse? He says, let let your light finish it then. Why? And the shining of your light The doing of your good works is not for your salvation. It's for the glory of God. What Jesus already did was to take care of your guilt. That's done and settled. That will never come up again. But the glorifying of God is still an issue. Yes. Our lifestyles, our performance, according to what Jesus says, is for the glory of God. Let your light so shine. So, this is the question... This is a question. Jesus' method of, of working in us is called the gospel or called the good news. If it does not work, who does it bring, us, bring, a, bring a, an indictment against? God and Jesus. 
You say, God make a plan of salvation and don't work. God saved people and they continue to live like reprobates. Yeah. Who is to be blamed? You blame the person who claims to be doing the work. Definitely. The gospel, really, the only way you can measure the gospel is by the fruit. God can save anybody he wants and God can pay the price for sin and that is covered. But does God's system of government really work? And so, what this brings to mind is something that we have already looked at but I'm emphasizing. The purpose of the gospel, the purpose of the gospel is not to Is not the, 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 the judgment, sorry, the judgment is not to justify you. It's not to justify you. That's not the purpose of the judgment. The purpose of the judgment is to justify. Christ what? Work, or I could use another word. Life, but I'm going to put it another way. Christ's government. Christ's system of doing things. God has claimed, God has made a claim that by Christ living in you, he solves the problem of sin. What does your life say about this system? Now, I want to tell you that I, I, I have personal experience in something, and I will share it. I think all of us might be able to say amen to this. But I've tried to, I've tried to do the right thing because of fear of being lost. And I never had, I never had, it was an up and down thing. I tried to do the right thing because I was trying to please people. And it was a struggle. When, 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 when I understand that God has saved me, that Jesus Christ, God has saved me through Jesus and he has set me free. When I understand is that my behavior either testifies for God or against God. Not me. I'm out of the picture. I have my salvation already. God provided it and put it down. And God says my only duty is to tell people about it. But what about the name of God? When I understand what he has done for me, I have a greater motivation to live for him. I have a greater motivation to rise above the things that have continued to plague me because I realize he has given me the ability, he has given me the power, he's living in me. The only thing is, whether or not I will, as Brother Bill says, cooperate. Whether I will choose to allow him to do this. When I recognize how much he has loved me, I want to do it for his sake. And I've found that it's a greater motivation. I find myself stronger, more able, more capable when my eyes are on his love than I am upon the first paradigm where I'm looking for. I must perform. I'm going to be judged. One version of Christianity brings fear and condemnation and a sense of uneasiness. The other, the other version sets you free, makes you know that you are already delivered and makes you as a free person choose of your own volition, your own voluntary will. I want to live for this God. I want to lift him up and glorify his name. Yes, Tina. Yes. So why is it then that we need the elders to speak on heaven? We need who? The elders. Are they what they say? Elders. In heaven. I think I think the, the ministry of the elders needs to be examined more closely. Okay? But at the same time there's also this. Even though Christ's life is what is being in question, our Christ's government. Here's a question. Are you in Christ? How do we know? We don't. So maybe that's where the elders come into the picture. Because, because even though 
Christ has saved all of us. The only way it can be told whether a person is in Christ or not. Jesus says, by their fruit you shall know them. Because it's not possible to be a Christian and live like a reprobate. Yes, but all the fruit of every Christian will show that Christ is number one in their lives. Right? Not all of us reach the same place. And some of us might... But, but the thing is, you know, I, I, I hope you know, right? Yesterday, when I became a Christian, yesterday I was a reprobate. And today, like you say, not everybody is at the same place, but the change was like night and day. Any angel in heaven, any human being on earth could have seen the difference. So even though I wasn't perfect, there was a great change that has stayed with me for, for 47 years. 47 years. And and, and, and and one other thing I'll say, you know, it's a mistake to believe that God is going to save people because they are perfect. I mean, I, I, I know that perfection glorifies God. But look here. You know what I say to, 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 to my father every morning almost? You know what I say? I know that you accept me in spite of myself. I know. You know what, you know what you, there, there are five words that I keep using. And I use them all the time. I know that I am loved. Everybody know that. I know that I am wanted. Not everybody knows that. And I mean by God, you know. God loves me and God wants me. I know that I am appreciated. What does it mean to appreciate? I'll tell you what it is, right? It's like, Tina, I tell you to wash the pot. And I tell you to do a good job. I come back and I see a little smear on the side, right? But I saw you washing it and I saw you trying. Look here, you make a mistake. How do you think I feel? I appreciate you. I appreciate my child who is trying to walk and he's stumbling and he's falling down and he's getting up again. I appreciate his effort. My father in heaven appreciates that every day that the sun rises, I want to please him. And I fail sometimes, but he appreciates my effort. God in heaven appreciates effort. God in heaven appreciates that you fail, but he's looking at the direction and where your heart is. All of that comes into the picture. And, you know, I want it, loved, appreciated, I'm accepted. I'm accepted. Accepted means that you belong in the house, right? You're a member of the family. You might, you might, you might, have some bad behavior, but you are my child and you are entitled to bad behavior because you are my child. And my duty when you behave bad is to lift you up and help you to do better. I accept you regardless whether you feel a thousand times you are still accepted because I accepted you in my family. Those are the things that I remember all the time because if you don't, if you don't understand these things, you, you live under a sense of false condemnation that does not come from God, but it comes from bad education and bad teaching. Thank you for your attentiveness, and I pray that the Lord may apply these words to our hearts.